right, folks, I am greatly honored to host this week's seminar speaker, one of the foremost um, leading bear biologists internationally. Um, he has defended bears comically against uh, the folks of Stephen Colbert on the Colbert Report. And uh, more importantly, um, he's a big proponent in conservation um, as being the co-chair of the bear specialist group for the IUCN SSC. So with that, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dave for help. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so the answer to the questions, what constellation is the North Star? Sorry? So the deal is this is Ursa Major, right? North Star, this points to the North Star, which is up here in Ursa Minor. How about what's the northernmost region of the Earth? What is that called? The Arctic. I know. Because it's the great bear, and in Greek, the word bear is Arctos. That's where Arctic comes from. All right, one last quiz. What kind of bear is this? Everybody get one of these in your mind. Golden moon bear, sun bear, lion bear, black-maned sloth bear, the Baluchistan sand bear, or the Hokkaido brown bear. Who votes for the golden moon bear? None. Sun bear. Few. Lion bear. You have to vote for one now. Black mane sloth bear. There we go. A lot of people on that one. Baluchistan sand bear. Nobody. Hokkaido brown bear. All right, we got somebody for that one. All right, I'll tell you later in the talk. <laughs> All right, the bears of the world are some species headed for extinction. Who thinks yes? Okay. We'll take a look. Um, there are bears that have gone extinct, a um, number of them. Um, who's heard of the cave bear? All right, European cave bear. There's actually known three species of cave bear that went extinct maybe 27,000 or so years ago. There's a whole bunch of bears from North and South America. These are all in a group called the short face bears. And there's 10 known species that have gone extinct. There's one extant species called the Andean bear, which lives in South America. This was the biggest of all of those short-faced bears, called the giant short-faced bear, which went extinct about 12,000 years ago. This is an artist's depiction of what that bear looked like compared to a modern-day grizzly bear. Um, the very last bear extinction that we know about was called the Florida cave bear, related to that present-day Andean bear in South America. It went extinct about 8,000 years ago, so not too long ago. And this is a very rare photograph that I obtained of this species from the camera traps that they had out 8,000 years ago <laughs> <clears throat> that we digitally enhanced. Uh, we don't actually know what this bear looked like. You know, maybe it looks like this is a modern-day Andean bear. Maybe it looks something like that, but a lot bigger. You can see what the jaw looks like, the mandible there, compared to the, the skull of a present-day Andean bear. So the living bears, this one is what? The black bear. Well, okay, so it's the American black bear. There's actually two species of black bears in the world. This is Ursus americanus, the American bear. It's mainly black, but it also comes in brown, or this is the, what's called the cinnamon phase, this sort of reddish-brown color. How about, who knows about this white-colored one? There's a white phase American black bear. This is called the Kermode bear. Um, this only lives on some islands in British Columbia up in Canada. And what's been found is that this white phase actually is better at hunting salmon during daylight hours, more successful. The salmon are less spooked by this coat color. And it lives with the black bears, the, the normal color black bears. At nighttime, both the, the white and the black are equally uh, successful. And there's also a, a rare white phase of the brown bear in Asia. So this was the historic distribution of this species. It's only ever occurred in three countries, Canada, the US, and Mexico. Uh, it's disappeared from most of the prairie regions, like here. Um, so you can see what that looks like. 
It lives in a variety of habitats. This is sort of a mixed forest in northern Minnesota. Here's a forest in Alaska. Here's some scrublands in Mexico. This is in northwestern Minnesota, really fragmented forest, a very adaptable, opportunistic species, um, very unparticular about where it dens. This is a female with two of her yearlings tucked into a sort of an open nest den, underground dens, cattail dens. Here's a bear that decided to den inside of a beaver lodge. Nice warm place. You see it's snow on its back there. Um, the other thing about this species is it actually has fairly large litters. Um, people think of bears as often as having two cubs. Uh, east of the Mississippi, including Minnesota, three cubs is more common. Um, we've had four cub litters, occasional five cub litters. This is the only species of bear that ever produces six cub litters, very rarely. And there's a number of states that were um, completely extirpated in bears and have been recolonized, Rhode Island, Kentucky, Missouri, Oklahoma, Texas, Nevada, and Ohio. And you can see a bunch of sightings, all those little blue dots there are just sightings of bears in places like North Dakota and um, even Illinois, and of course here in Iowa. This bear is very tolerant of people, um, cabins, cornfields, all that damage that you see there is bear damage. Um, even in kind of urban areas like this, um, they feel <laughs> comfortable around people's houses, very comfortable at times. And people are often very comfortable around this species of bears because they're not, they're not really aggressive or dangerous for the most part. Uh, I don't recommend any of this kind of behavior, but nevertheless, people get away with it. Not very many people are attacked or killed by this species of bear. This is probably one of the most docile species of bears in the world. They are legally hunted in all the Canadian provinces where they exist. They only don't, the only place they don't exist is Prince Edward Island. They are legally hunted in 32 U.S. states. There's been new bear seasons since the year 2000 in New Jersey, Maryland, Kentucky, Oklahoma, Nevada. So it's clearly doing well, expanding geographically and numerically. This is what species? So grizzly bear or brown bear is the same species. Ursus arctos. Ursus is the Latin for bear. Arctos is the Greek for bear. This was named by Linnaeus because this bear occurs in Sweden, and he basically only knew of one species of bear, and he called it bear bear. <laughs> Great name. Um, you know about the really big ones of this and Kodiak Island. People refer to it as the Kodiak bear. It's really just a brown bear. Uh, really big ones in Kamchatka um, in Russia. These are the ones that eat salmon. And basically, the size of the bear is related to what they eat. And those bears that eat salmon are bigger than those bears that don't. Uh, the interior bears that have this grizzled kind of fur are called grizzly bears because of the grizzling of their fur, that kind of white tip on their hair. And some of these bears come in darker shades like this. This is uh, um, one of the Kamchatka bears. You can see the sort of two-tone thing. Very dark colored ones. This is a bear from uh, Tibet. So this is the original range of, of this species. You can see it occurs on three continents, uh, North America, Europe, and Asia. Basically only Western North America. There's a few sort of fossil sites in a few places where it sporadically occurred in the east, but people don't really know if there were ever very many of the grizzly bears in the east. Um, you can see how it's disappeared. Again, I'll show you. If you take a just look at North America for a minute, you can see it's disappeared from most of the lower 48. If you look at Europe there for a minute, you see it disappeared from a lot of that. It's in 48 different range countries, most widely distributed bear species in the world. The thing that happened to it in North America is that it was preying on cattle and sheep, dangerous to people, very dangerous compared to black bears. And so people sought to get rid of them, and government sought to get rid of them. They were bountied. People were re rewarded for killing them and for wiping them out. For example, these is a picture of the guys that killed the last grizzly bear in Mexico, and we're very proud of it. And their picture is 
you know, framed in places like they killed like an outlaw or something like that. A lot of these last bears were actually named and people went out to find and kill the last named grizzly bear and were very proud to have eliminated the bear, the last bear in Arizona, the last bear in California, et cetera. <clears throat> The same sort of thing happened in Europe, but not quite as intensively. Um, there are 10 remaining populations in Europe, and they're all actually doing well now. They're all recovering. There's four of them that are really tiny, these, uh, these two in uh, Spain and France. There's two in Italy here that are really small, less than 200 bears are considered critically endangered. And one of the limiting factors of these is that people want to restrain them. They don't want the populations to get bigger because they're afraid of the bears killing sheep, and so there's a conflict between those conservationists that want these populations to expand and the people that, that are sheep shepherds. This is taking a look at uh, brown bear populations in Asia. We have some really big populations. We have some very small populations, uh, like up here in the Gobi or over here in the Hindu Kush, um, very small, isolated populations of, again, these were all just brown bears. Just taking a look at why some of these are small. This is a picture of the Gobi and a bear in the Gobi there. They're really tiny bears. These bears are even smaller than sort of normal American black bears. You can see very little to eat in a place like this. Uh, here's a, a place in Pakistan where they've had very successful conservation, protecting the bears, making sure nobody kills them. Um, the bears are, you can see, quite, um, they look different. They can actually identify each individual bear and that graph that you see there is a, basically a count of all these different individuals going up through time. This was an exciting finding in Syria. Bears have been wiped out of Syria. The last one that we knew about was about early 1950s. There were some tracks recorded in the early, uh, like 2004, some more tracks recorded in the snow in 2011. And then just this last winter, somebody got a picture of what we think is a bear on a cell phone. It's a, it's a little bit blurry. It doesn't quite look like a bear, but it actually matches the coat color, that white color of what used to be described as Syrian bears back in the 1800s. So this species is the one I was talking about before. This is the Andean bear. It's also called the spectacled bear because it's got these eye rings that look like spectacles or glasses. The one in the back there you can see has a white face, some have a black face. It's also called the ornate bear, Tremarctos ornatus. It's in a subfamily different than all these other ones that I'll, that I'll be talking about um, because it is a short-faced bear. So it's that group of short-faced bears of which most of the species died out. This is the one relic species left. It's in these six countries of South America, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and just recently, just this last year, confirmed to be present in Argentina. Um, this is the first one I'll be talking about that's a vulnerable species or a threatened species. The IUCN has these categories, least concern, near threatened, and then three threatened categories, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, and then extinct. So this one and all the other ones I'll be talking about today, except one, we have one endangered bear, and the rest of them from now on are all considered vulnerable bears. Um, also occurs in a lot of different habitats, um, from sort of low deserts, 200 meters elevation, up to um, somewhere around, you know, we've tracked these bears over 15,000 feet. Um, pretty magnificent climbers. Here's a mother and her cub walking along a cliff face. This even outdoes you there, Chris. Um, they're most at home in these cloud forest type things, and they eat uh, bromeliads, things that are like uh, in the pineapple family. The big deal with these bears is that they do prey on cattle. People graze their cattle, sometimes even in national parks there. There's not enough guards and whatnot. The bears will kill the cattle, as will mountain lions, and then they'll put some poison in the cattle to kill whatever is killing their cattle. This is claimed to be the biggest threat to this species of bears, but the fact of the matter is we don't actually know what the mortality rates are, how many bears are actually killed. We don't know how many there are in any place in South America. There's not good estimates on anything. We don't even know whether the populations are really going up or down. Okay, now we'll move to Asia. This is called the sloth bear. 
Mel ursus. Mel means honey. Ursus bear, ursinus bear, the honey bear bear. Um, of course, all the bears basically like honey, maybe except not polar bears, but nevertheless, this bear got the name honey bear. Um, it only lived on the Indian subcontinent. And it's known to have just recently, in about the past 15 years, gone extinct in Bangladesh. Um, we don't actually know what the heck happened in Bhutan. I was curious about whether this bear actually lived in Bhutan. I went there. We did some surveys there. We came up with one camera trap photo of one of these bears about a half a mile across the border from India into Bhutan. There's quite a few on the Indian side. And there's no historical records, documented historical records, anywhere in Bhutan. So although they had these range maps of this bear all over Bhutan, I actually don't think they actually exist there and maybe never have. Um, very fragmented populations. The red here shows where we know they exist. The yellow are places that we kind of hope they exist, but we don't really know for sure. Um, these bears um, will raid crops. This is a picture from back in 1807. There's a quote from this guy's book where he says, to the native, the bear is a foe to be shirked unless under the protecting convoy of European sportsmen, when a whole village will gladly turn out to beat the field to keep the bear out. So you can see dogs here and horses and whatnot, and the bear is chased up here, and there's a shooter up here in the, in the tree. Um, this was um, one of those species that people did sport hunt. I mean, the main quarry were tigers, rhinos, elephants, but bears were another big one there. So a lot of the, you know, this is back when Britain owned India, and so a lot of the people that went there went there as sport hunters. And so this species was hunted quite a bit. One of the things they would go, do is go to these boulder fields and, and shoot bears in boulder fields. Um, wait or wait for them to come out of the field. They, they, they would hide down in these cracks during the daytime when it's real hot. They'd come out in the evening, and there's all kinds of fantastic stories like this guy. This is from a book from 1906 where the guy had a hand-to-hand -hand combat with this bear. Eventually, they all fell off the cliff, and the guy grabbed onto that little tree and saved himself and climbed back up and got to write about it and sell a few books. Um, this is sort of typical habitat for this species. So you can see it here um, with termite mounds. It actually eats termites. It's tiger, rhinos, boulder fields that they live in. So they go into these boulder fields when it's really hot. They stay there they, and they come out. You can see this, this picture that I took in sort of um, evening time when it's getting cooler they will come out and you'll see bunches of them coming out like this or all sort of crammed together in these boulder fields this is what it looks like so they'll come down into people's fields and raid crops and whatnot these are really ferocious bears super aggressive um, way more than a grizzly bear and more people are mauled by this bear every year than all the other species combined hundreds of people in India and Pretty, pretty gruesome. They like to attack the face. Um, and the odd thing about it is that this is a termite eater. This is not a carnivorous bear that takes down deer or anything else like that. It eats termites and it has long claws for digging into termite mounds. And then it has this space right here. These two incisors are gone so it can suck up termites like this. And then it's got really big canines. So what would be the deal? Why would, you, why would it have really big canines to eat termites? These, the, these, these canines are what tear people's face apart, as well as the big claws. But what's the deal with the big, the big canines? So the deal is they live in ti with tigers. And they interact with tigers. And during a study that we were doing in Nepal, we actually saw five fights between sloth bears and tigers. And sloth bears won four of the five. So they, Pre, and that, that, that's why they're so aggressive, too, because you're live, living with tigers, basically. Um, here's a, an example of a hole that this bear dug. It took about an hour and a half or so to dig this hole to get down into a termite nest that's two meters down underground, that somehow it ended up smelling this and was worth digging all the way down there and going and then crawling out of the hole and leaving. Okay, the next species of bear, so I mentioned there was another black bear. This is it. This is the Asiatic black bear, Ursus tibetanus, the bear of what? 
Tibet. Right? They used to spell Tibet, T-H-I-B-E-T. -E so the bear of Tibet is where it was first discovered. There are a few, bear, a few of these in Tibet. It's not sort of a hot spot for this species. It's just picked up its name because of where it was first discovered. And you can see how much it looks like. This is the sloth bear on this side. This is the Asiatic black bear here. They both have kind of a big mane. The sloth bear is more shaggy. The sloth bear has a white snout. You can't really see this one, but they both have this big white V on the chest. And so this bear is also called the moon bear because it looks like it's got sort of a crescent moon on its chest. And as I mentioned with the American black bear coming in different phases of color, um, this one does have this one rare color phase called the golden moon bear. Nobody got that. <laughs> I did have a huge prize in my backpack, which I hauled all the way here to give out to the winner, but nobody got it. Sorry about that. Um, this, uh, there's only been about five or six of these specimens that have ever been seen or collected. Um, collected, I mean, actually put in captivity. Um, and they're, and they're, they're in like Vietnam and Laos. So this is the historic distribution. It occurred in 18 countries and it still occurs in 18 countries, um, but it's much more fragmented now if you look at that. So it goes all the way out here to Iran and then all the way up here to Russia and out in Japan and Taiwan and down here into Southeast Asia. The main stronghold of this species is in China. You can see a lot of that has disappeared. So this is a guy in China, and he was telling us that there had been a, a bear in his cornfield, and the bear bit him on the back. That's what he's describing here. And these bears, they're not quite as aggressive as a sloth bear, but close. They're, they're much more aggressive than our American black bear. They're very similar to our American black bear ecologically, but in terms of their temperament, they're much more aggressive. And so when people go to chase these bears out of their cornfield, it is kind of a dangerous thing and they will and the bears will attack people. You can see this guy has really got his face bitten up by a by a bear. The the main threat to this species, there is some issues with habitat loss, but the primary threat to this species is poaching. So this shows here a poaching camp that we came across in China in a well protected panda reserve. One of the most protected panda reserves anywhere in China. And they're very proud of their pandas, but this was at a slightly lower elevation where there aren't any pandas and there's black bears and these people were poaching black bears. And they have, they have some traps, like this guy setting a trap here, and particularly snares, though, are the main, the main things. And, and they'll catch a lot of different species, but the big target is black bears. And you can see here's, here's another situation. This is actually in, in Laos where all these snares were picked up and they're targeting black bears. And this is the thing that they're after. That people want the gallbladder. And what is the gallbladder for? Is it aphrodisiac? Is it hocus pocus, pocus medicine? What is it? Turns out that in traditional Chinese medicine, this has been around for a long, long time. Some people say 2,000 years. I was able to trace it back to at least 1,300 years ago in the Chinese pharmacopoeia. And this stuff actually has been shown through clinical trials even in the United States, with very reputable people published in very good journals, this stuff really works for a lot of different things. There are various kinds of inflammation, uh, liver disease, eye ailments, um, even things like Parkinson's. And this is probably the closest thing that actually has some medicinal effect for Alzheimer's. And it's unfortunate, in a way, that bears are being targeted for this, but it's a, it's a medicine. But the thing about it is... It can be synthesized, and it can be synthesized really easily from bile of other species, like pig bile and chicken bile and stuff that is you know, killed in massive numbers. And you just have to tweak it a little chemically, and you can basically get urso, the urso deoxycholic acid, which is the active ingredient in bear bile. Now, the Chinese will claim that the synthesized product is not as good. Nobody has ever done a clinical test testing synthesized product versus bear bile. So we don't actually know. But what they claim is that, and this part's true, there's more than 100 different compounds in bear bile, and they claim that there's sort of a synergistic effect between all these things. In fact, in traditional Chinese medicine, 
they believe you need to take sort of a balanced medicine. They will often cut this stuff with other sorts of herbal things so that, so that it's balanced. And they really believe in a balanced medicine, unlike us where you just you know, take ibuprofen straight. They're like horrified by why would anybody do that? You have to take it in sort of a mixture. And so synthesized, full-strength bare bile is not something that they would want to even try. So their solution to the issue of poaching bears is to farm bears. It started off as actually sort of a communist sort of dictation that we will farm bears to benefit our people to produce this medicine. And they have at least 20,000, we don't know the real numbers, we're trying to get at this, but at least 20,000 or so bears on farms and they, they drain the bile. So you can see China is the main, the main country, Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, and South Korea also have some farms smaller. Um, there's different ways of extracting the bile. All those other countries will um, knock the bear out, you know, immobilize it, and then they use like an ultrasound to find the gallbladder and stick in a big needle and draw it out. So you can't extract the bile very frequently. In China, the way they do it is the bear is in a cage like this, and the bear is like eating some rice. They have um, surgically connected the gallbladder to the outside of the body. They've created a little tube, and the tube is so narrow that it won't drip naturally. So it's just sort of closed off on its own. And the guy just crawls underneath there, and he takes a little like catheter, basically a little straw, and sticks it up into that tube, which opens it up enough. And um, then he sticks a little bowl underneath it like that, and you get the bear bile. And then they will dry this, and they'll put it into capsules, and then they sell the capsules, and then people will mix it with various herbs. And you get a prescription. You have something you know, wrong, you can get a prescription to go in and, and get bear bile. And one of the questions we had in terms of conservation is, um, you know, what is this? Is this having a positive or a negative effect? So one issue is, how are these bears getting to these bear farms? And initially, they had to stock them from the wild. So clearly, that was a negative in terms of conservation. Um, this is one of the farms I visited. And you see a pile of cubs like this. And you have no idea, are these cubs coming from the wild or are these breeding you know, in, in the farm? And they all say, in China now, they say everything is self-perpetuating and being bred. But it's unclear whether that's really true. The second and possibly bigger thing is, by selling this farmed bile, a lot of people that could never have afforded the wild bile are now brought into the market. So there's now a huge number of people that are getting prescriptions for bear bile because it's quite cheap, readily available. It's in every pharmacy around China. And a lot of people get into the market because of this. And sometimes they'll take it and they'll find out, wow, that stuff really works. It's really great. Now, if you have, let's say, your mom is sick and she's, whoa, the, the, the farm bile doesn't seem to be working for her very well. And somebody says to you, yeah, it's because that farm bile is not quite as pure as the stuff in the wild. In traditional Chinese medicine, it's a big deal to have a wild product. It's viewed as better, just inherently better. And so our concern is that by stimulating the demand for this stuff, this product, that actually more people are also demanding the wild bile rather than being taken away from the demanding wild bile. It's a hard question to answer. We've, over the past two years, gotten the Chinese to agree to a major study of this. And they finally have allowed us to do this, and we're just getting started on this study. And of course, the other question is, can we ever convince them to use the synthesized product? There's one bear farm that has just announced, like a month ago, that they might start getting into producing synthesized bear bile. But not just urso, not just urso deoxycholic acid, but actually trying to reproduce all of those things that are in bear bile. We'll see, see what happens with that. But it's sort of unknown right now where that's all going. The other issue with this species, back to the Asiatic black bears, is they're hunted for their paws. This is not traditional Chinese medicine. This is just a delicacy. It's basically for rich guys to go take their business buddies out and, and pay, you know, 500 bucks for a bowl of bear paw soup. And you have to sort of prove that it really is bear paw. And so a lot of times they will actually have the live bears at the restaurant killed, you know, to treat these guys to bear paw soup. This is a, a shipment that was coming in from Russia. 
Okay, this species, what does that look like on its chest? The other one was a moon. This one is a sun. So this is a... Got it. Helarctos. Hel means sun. Hel, Arctos, sun, bear, Malayanus, the sun bear of Malaysia. So, yeah, and this species is very common in Malaysia, but you can see the, the chest marking is actually individually distinctive. Camera trapping this species is kind of a joy because you can tell them all apart. Um, they don't all look like suns. Here's the historic distribution in Southeast Asia. Originally 11 countries, it's now down to nine. It's disappeared in China and in uh, Bangladesh. Again, look back at that. It likes these lowland, dense, tropical forests. It eats primarily fruits, um, many different species of fruits. In just single study areas, the species would eat somewhere around 120 different species of fruits. And a lot of times, in this part of the world, all these fruits, they all become ripe at once. And they have these with things called a masting event, where it's just fruit everywhere, you know, just covering the ground and everything else, and these bears get super fat, and then all of a sudden, nothing the next year, and all the fruits disappear. And this is kind of a natural cycle. It's been in, kind of gotten more um, intense in these cycles with climate change, and, and, and it's related to the El Ninos. And so these bears also eat insects, and they're very good at eating insects. This, these pictures are actually shot by a tourist, and you can see the mother and her cub way up in this tree. They also have really big canines, and they use them for ripping, basically ripping this tree apart, and they eat bees. And in and, and this part of the world, the bees don't sting. They're called stingless bees, and they're just almost like flies. Um, but they dig into, and they dig these really deep holes in the trees like this. Um, they also forage on the ground for insects in broken logs and things like that. And so this bear, so watch this bear now, about a year later, looked like this. And a little while later, starved to death. So this is the only species we knew of in the world that actually regularly starves in the wild. So they can get by without fruit for a while. But as the fruit, you know, after about a year and a half, two years, without those fruits, they just can't make it on just insects alone. And they will starve like that. And they'll also go and uh, raid people's gardens and whatnot. So here's this poor woman. She's got maybe about 12 of these coconut trees. And Bear came in one night and destroyed, basically destroyed, I think, eight of them or something like that. They, they don't eat the coconuts. They eat the meristem of the tree and basically kill the tree. And now, that, now it's gone. So this lady is, like, dependent on this stuff, and it's gone. You can't blame these people for putting out some poison, putting out some snares, trying to get, get rid of the bear. And of course, you can't blame the bear because it's hungry, right? It's like hasn't seen natural fruit in the forest for a year and a half. The, the primary place where this species live, its stronghold here is in, as I mentioned, this species is from Malaysia. So we have Malaysia up here in the green and Indonesia over here, the island of Borneo and the island of Sumatra. And uh, this place right here is called the Isthmus of Kra. And it's kind of this narrowing in the Malaysian Peninsula. And the, the weather down here, or the climate, I guess, down here, is very different than north of here. There's an abrupt change right at that line. And it has to do with the, uh, basically the currents that, that come through here. And everything is quite different down here. And Asiatic black bears only come down as far as that line. And then it's sun bears, believed to have evolved south of that line, and then moved back north again. But I'd like to take you a little bit of a trip south of that line. This is what's happening. Um, tremendous deforestation. This is the island of Sumatra. This is 1985. The green here is the forested area, about 60% forest. Here's 1990, 50%. Here's the year 2000, 30%. And 2007, we're down 25% forest, you know, very rapidly disappearing. Here's the, the island of Borneo. Um, the original up here is 1973. All the red here was logged. Um, this is the remaining in the year 2010. Basically, this is the only sort of original forest that's left. This is all really highlands, so they can, the, the forest companies can't get into that, that area left. Um, but, they're, but they're trying to work their way up there to, get, um, to basically log that area. 
And the reason that they log it, number one, is to get the wood out, but number two is to plant oil palm. It's a major industry, and, and, and Indonesia and Malaysia switch back and forth as being number one and number two in oil palm production in the world. And, it, and that's what their economy is driven by. That is their number one product, their, their number one export product, and it's also used internally. That's what they cook with. That's what they make a lot of foods with. It, it, they are completely dependent on this stuff. And so they wipe out the forest. They plant this stuff. And, you know, it's in all kinds of food. It's in lots of different processed foods. Watch what you're eating. Look over on the, on the back of what you're eating, and a lot of times it will say oil palm or palm kernel or something like this. Um, but unfortunately, in the United States, it can be labeled as vegetable oil. Legally, it can be labeled as vegetable oil, so you don't even know that you're eating oil palm. This was a study site that, that we had in the um, northern part, of, right over here, the northern part of uh, Malaysian <coughs> Borneo. The, the green was the only forested area. This is what it looks like on the ground. You get there by boat. This is some oil palm next to the forest. What they do is they go through and they, they cut it in these big chunks. They leave it laying there for a bit, and a truck comes by, and they throw it on the back of the truck. So it's just sitting out there for animals to take, sometimes for a day or two. Um, there's a lot of monkeys and pigs and whatnot that come through the area and take it. There's a lot of spillage of the oil palm kernels on the ground, so it attracts lots of animals. Fortunately, the bears do not ruin the trees. They just take the scraps on the ground. We've interviewed hundreds of people. They seem like they don't really care so much that the bears are in there. They don't like the pigs because they come in these giant groups. They don't like the elephants because the elephants do mow down the trees. They don't like the orangutans because they break the trees, and they're kind of dangerous. But the bears, people don't seem to mind or don't see one or the other. The bears will stay in the forest basically all day, and then at night they kind of sneak into these plantations. And the stuff is very nutritious. And what we notice is that bears that eat this stuff end up being fat. Um, so it is good for them in a way, but the question is, you know, you're living in a forest over here, how far in will you go? Because these things go on for miles, you know, sometimes like 30 miles across one of these things. So. You know, obviously, the edge is really good, but the, the middle is not bear habitat anymore. All right, two more species left on your ride around the world here, the polar bear or the sea bear, Ursus maritimus. This species is classified as a marine mammal, officially a marine mammal. So it lives in five, five countries, Canada, the U.S., uh, Russia, and um, Greenland, which is um, Denmark, and then Svalbard, which is owned by Norway. And so why do polar bears need ice? We know that there's a big problem with ice disappearing. What's the deal with the ice? Just getting around. Getting around, walking around, uh, or feeding. So the deal is it's the only way that they can get their food. They need the ice as a platform to catch seals, period. And without that, they can't eat. Um, there are places in the world, so there's different kinds of ice. And if I can just draw your attention to the green ice here. So this is uh, Quebec right over here. Okay, this is Hudson Bay. Churchill is like right over here. And so there's five populations of polar bears here that live on this green ice. And that ice is seasonal ice. And it's basically melts in the summer and disappears. And it's not a climate change thing. It's always been this way. This ice disappears in the summertime. And these bears come off. And these are, this is what they do. They kind of walk around at the edge. They're hoping that like a, maybe a whale or something washes in to eat. Um, they don't eat. They fast. And, and this ice will be gone for three months. And they just basically sit around waiting, walking around, being pretty lazy. And they're very good at fasting. And in fact, after this three months fast, when the ice comes back, they all go back out to eat seals. That's when the females go into hibernation and give birth. And so a female will actually go for 10 months without eating and give birth and nurse her cubs. And it's the most dramatic fasting of any mammal in the world. So they're very adapted to fasting. But the thing is, what's going to happen in the future? So in the winter, there will always be some ice in the Arctic, but the projection is that by the year 2040, there will be virtually, in the summertime, virtually no ice. So all the populations will then be 
open water. And it'll be open water for a long time. And so that female that could go 10 months fasting now may end up with no ice. She'll wake up in April and say, all right, great, now I can take my cubs out on the ice and it's already melted. And what's going to happen then? So that's the issue with this species. It's not that they can't go through some periods of fasting without ice, but it's like, how long can they go? The, the conundrum with this is that this species was not that long ago evolved from brown bears, and brown bears are very good at eating berries and whatnot. There's lots of berries up there. These bears will like sit down on a patch of berries, get their butt all blue, and they won't turn around and eat them. And you know what's the deal with that? There's recent evidence of these bears preying on um, bird nests like murres and geese, and there's millions of geese up in the Arctic. Um, but a recent paper just came out and analyzed all this stuff, and they basically said there's no way that these bears can survive on terrestrial foods. Um, there is some question still remaining about um, whether they could survive on fish, for example. They, they, they are specifically adapted to um, eating fatty food. So they have these basically five genes that brown bears don't have. This is polar bears here, this is brown bears, these five different genes that polar bears have them and brown bears don't, and they have to do with metabolizing lipids. And so they're specialists on this, and they're specialists at catching seals. They're not very good at catching fish. There's Arctic char runs in the Arctic, lots and lots of fish, and they are terrible, absolutely terrible at catching fish. And whether they will be able to do that, I don't know. There's competition now from brown bears moving north into these char streams, and the brown bears actually displacing the polar bears. They probably won't get a chance to even practice catching fish. They're not going to be able to catch seals out in the open water. And there's some monitoring going on now with polar bears from satellites, where you can actually see them from satellite photos. So look at the yellow dots, the yellow uh, things here. There's white spots, and then a picture a week later, and the, and the white spots are gone. That was a polar bear that was there. We've checked this out with helicopters, and it's actually a pretty cool way of monitoring populations. All right, last species. This one is the what? So which, are, which is going on here? So what's the deal? What's this species? Okay, red panda, and this is the giant panda. Right, and they're both together in the what family? So this one is in its own family, the Euridae. Sorry for leading you astray. This one's actually a real bear, the Ursidae. A Europoda means panda foot. Melanoleuca means black and white, black and white animal with a panda foot. So the deal is that the red panda was named first, and the red panda has got this radial sesamoid bone that looks like it has an extra digit, and the giant panda has an even bigger one. And so it looks like it's got six digits, and so it has a panda foot so that it can hold carrots. Well, they, they're both bamboo eaters, and that's what it is, convergent evolution on eating bamboo. So the original range of this species is basically China, and the current range is China, but you can see how much that shrunk. It's basically living in the worst of its worst habitat. The absolute mountains at the edge of the range where it was barely surviving before, that's what's left for this species. So this is the only species that's considered globally endangered. A lot of its habitat has been reduced. Uh, the Chinese are actually incredibly good now at planting trees, and they have major reforestation efforts. The number one country in the world by far for reforestation. They're not planting the right trees, but in terms of the, the, basically the, the, the area of the trees that they planted is, is absolutely incredible. They actually have protected also a lot of reserves. They've created 65 reserves just for pandas to protect them. There's still a lot of fragmentation among these reserves, and some of these are really small populations of pandas, but nevertheless, pretty good job at protecting them. This is a bamboo specialist based on their teeth, based on their genes. Um, they don't hibernate in the winter. There's bamboo basically around all the time. And their numbers apparently are going up. There was just a recent what they call panda census, where they said there's eight 1,864 pandas. Um, no confidence intervals on this. They know exactly how many pandas they have. And so you may wonder how they have done this, this miraculous panda 
survey, and it's based on scats. And so, of course, what you're thinking, DNA in scats, wrong. No, it's based on the length of the bamboo fragments in these scats after they eat them. And basically, you go through, you measure 100 of these things, you get a mean, and then you can tell whether that mean is different than, you know, 4.03 is different than 4.07, the next scat up the trail. And that's the way they do it. It's kind of appalling, but nevertheless, they got exact numbers of pandas, and the population has gone up 17%. I really do think panda numbers have gone up, but we don't actually know how many pandas there are. The thing that's happening in the future is an issue with climate change. And the climate change is not going to affect pandas, but it's just like with polar bears, it's going to affect their food. And it's going to affect bamboo. And every model that's been run on what's going to happen with bamboo in the future looks really dismal. So this is a percent change here. And you can see into the future, basically we're down to minus 100% in this scenario, minus 100% in this scenario. And what does minus 100% mean? You're down to goose egg, right? So there's no bamboo left. So that's an issue for pandas if there's no bamboo left. And that's maybe in 100 years. So the bamboo can't go any further up the mountain because you basically hit rock and ice. There's a limit to how far you can go. But if you remember, pandas once lived all the way out in eastern China. There's a different kind of bamboo there. It's a very low elevation bamboo. And some people just had an idea about, hey, maybe we should move some of that bamboo over to western China where they live. And this bamboo now could live there with, the cl with climate change. Um, so it's possible that pandas could be saved, we don't know, by moving some bamboo. That would be sort of an easy, an easy solution to all that. So to wrap up, here's the eight species of bears we went through. American black bears are doing wonderfully, about 900,000 in the world. More than twice all the other bears put together, their populations are expanding, they're hunted, they're controlled hunts, whatever. They are by far the most adaptable species. They're in really great shape. Brown bears are in really good shape in most of the places in the world. A few small populations here and there where they're in trouble, but otherwise doing pretty well. This species, a sun bear, pretty worried about that. We're projecting maybe a 40% decline over the next 30 years just based on mainly on palm oil and their habitat disappearing. Polar bears, of course, we're worried about the sea ice melting. It's unclear how fast it's going to happen, but for sure it's going to happen. And how this species end up surviving after a century or so, we don't really know. And there aren't any brilliant ideas about saving them right now. Asiatic black bears, the issue is poaching, the whole gallbladder thing, and whether that can be saved maybe just by switching the Chinese over to synthetic bear bile if they'll ever go that well. And giant pandas, we'll see what happens with their bamboo and whether there's an issue, a way to save them that way. But that's basically the status. The Indian bear and the sloth bear are pretty unknown at this point. So one minute for questions. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question, and of course, there's a lot of debate about whether humans kill, you know, wipe these species out. Um, there's also a thing about their food sources being wiped out in some cases because some of them were really carnivorous. So I don't know the answer. Yep. Right. So, yeah, I mean, the easy solution would be if we could switch them over to synthesize stuff. And I don't think that we can. And presently, our study is just to try to find out whether the farming itself was good or bad. And that's what the whole study is about. And we actually don't know. So I went into it thinking for sure that the farming is bad. There's a lot of campaigns against farming on basically animal welfare grounds. Um, but I've gone into it from a conservation standpoint. We went to what's called the World Conservation Congress. We got a, um, um, 
a thing passed there where the Chinese are basically mandated to do this study. But it's taken two and a half years now to get them to give us all the permissions. And they're actually going to fund most of the study to try to find out is the bear farms good or bad for conservation. And then hopefully, as this thing progresses, we can get into talking about the synthetic pile. Yep. <clears throat> It's a good question, and, and, and we don't think so. I mean, most of the American black bear populations are very closely monitored by state biologists like myself. So I work for the Minnesota DNR, and my main job is monitoring American black bears in Minnesota. And we've had you know, somewhere around 600 bears radio collared, no evidence of any poaching for gallbladders. But hunters can legally take a bear and use the gallbladder or give it away. They're just not allowed to sell it. So that's the, that's the only issue with it. And we don't actually see very much even in terms of use. Most hunters, we've done surveys, and most hunters don't even take it out of the woods. They'll, they'll gut the bear and leave it in the woods. The curious thing is that there's somewhere around 40 to 45,000 American black bears killed every year in North America in hunts, and all those gallbladders get wasted. And we never know if what if state agencies collected them and used them you know, to send over to China. Would that be helpful or not? It's the same kind of question as with, uh, with the bear farming. We don't actually know which way it would go. Um, some people claim, you know, every once in a while there's a bunch of po poacher killed with a bunch of gallbladders shipping them someplace or another, but it's never, it never leads to any big giant ring or something like that. It, it, it does go on. The curious thing is that all the species of bears except pandas can breed with each other and produce fertile offspring, which is quite curious because it even includes the Andean bear, which has a different number of chromosomes. So I don't know actually how that works. But polar bears and brown bears are really closely related and can easily breed except behaviorally. That's the only thing that sort of blocks it. And they can produce fertile offspring, and those offspring have been found in the Arctic. The thing is, there's way more people looking in the Arctic now, studying species in the Arctic, and so of course we run into these more often, and so we don't actually know if it's something that's occurring more often or just been witnessed more often. But it doesn't seem like it's a huge issue. The bigger issue would be that because brown bears are moving north, and brown bears are much better ex at exploiting a terrestrial habitat, it sort of prevents polar bears from the fallback option of possibly, as the ice melts, adapting to that terrestrial habitat. If they didn't have this competitor moving in, maybe they would start eating berries, maybe they would start catching salmon. But because of the brown bears, they are being pushed away. Anything else? Okay, thanks very much.